Avant-garde. Noun. New and unusual or experimental ideas, especially in the arts, are the people introducing them. Adjective. Favoring or introducing experimental or unusual ideas. The reason I'm starting with the definition of avant-garde is to talk about the cultural mainstream when it comes to Not only entertainment and the arts, but the cultural mainstream in the broadest sense when it comes to our lives. You see, the cultural mainstream isn't avant-garde. And the state of like cinema or the state of the film industry specifically, um, I've noticed that the people that are making it in the industry now, they're not creatives. They're grinders. I say that because there's a respect for the establishment that permeates like not only film, but like mainstream art. And this also applies to uh, academia. It's ever present. It's uh, very sanitized. And the reason I started this podcast wasn't just to talk about films, even though I will be talking about yet another film. Um, And it won't be just me ranting by myself. I do plan on having people on to talk about stuff. Film, yes. Books, yes. Maybe even a little politics. But let's not talk about that right now. Let's get back on to this cultural mainstream not being avant-garde discussion. Um, I feel like sex will be one of the major determining factors between Hollywood mainstream films and independent films. And the reason I say that is because the films that they're making today are like completely sexless. And I understand why. Um, I was actually having a conversation with some people who are budding filmmakers. um, And one of the One of them actually brought up that they were making a film that had to do with human trafficking and sex work. But this person made it a, made it clear, let me say, that they would be making this project but there would be no sex in it and this person said that they weren't even interested in that like had no interest in like filming um you know simulated sex on screen or even having any sort of uh sexuality whatsoever on screen and i understood it i get it um no one wants to go near um any sort of uh potential onset sexual situations because of the sensitivity that exists now culturally, right? Um, there is a there is a sensitivity when it comes to gender roles, um uh, objectification, um and and we're just really sort of 
going through this moment in time where um, there's been a lot of new sort of ideas introduced to the mainstream, like to the mainstream discourse that previously wasn't there before and that people are just kind of now like getting used to or like trying to wrap their heads around. And I just find myself thinking more and more about transgressive art and transgressive film and the elements of transgressiveness that comes with making sort of outsider, non-mainstream works of art, whether it's film, whether it's painting, whether it's music, any, any art form. Um, there has always been a clear designation between what's mainstream and what's not. And the problem that I see now is that there is an expectation by the masses, and maybe it's kind of always been this way, but it's just a little bit, it's very different given that we live in the internet age, right? So I think the awareness about certain things is far more pronounced. And, in, and, and we're far more aware as a society, but at the same time, we know almost less, which is another weird sort of like contradiction that exists, I think, at least again, when it comes to like the broader discourse, the mainstream sort of cultural uh, discussion or discussions. Um, where was I? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so there has to be a designation between the two in order to push art in new directions. And the problem that I see that exists now is that, again, there's this expectation that all art adhere or adheres to these sort of ideas of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and I don't want to wade too far into cancel culture discourse. I feel like uh, there's enough conversations about that um, out there for anyone to seek out. It's a constant conversation. It's one that you know, I know everyone has heard, right? Um, and while I don't want to wade too far into that, I will say um, some of that stems from what I'm talking about. Some of it. Now, I'm not somebody who is um, particularly worried about cancel culture. Um, and maybe that just has to do with my upbringing, right? Maybe that just has to do with like uh, my, m you know, my background and how I how I grew up in, in in my own sort of like belief system and personal sort of like principles, right? Where like I don't worry about that kind of thing um, because my guiding principles are sort of, you know, based on like. real actual beliefs if that makes sense whatsoever <laughs> um but i say all of that to say that there's a new kind of again i know i repeat myself but there is this unrealistic expectation amongst the mainstream that 
certain types of things can be done and certain types of things can't be done. And I know that that's existed in previous eras. I do. Um, I know that. But I've just been paying attention to how it exists in the current era, in 2021. And I truly believe that we are in a strange sort of space because there's more pushback now, at least in my lifetime, there's more pushback that I, like I've seen, you know, I've seen, it feels to me that in my life experience, I'm seeing more pushback than I ever have before uh, when it comes to, you, you know, um, what's good and what's bad and what's safe and what's palatable. See, when it comes to the art that I'm interested in, I'm not interested in this new sort of sanitized, prepackaged, uh, marketed, capitalist product that is being in content. Content is a great word. And content is a buzzword that everyone talks about. And I feel it's appropriate because the majority of the things that we see now are in fact content. They are not art. They are content. I am not interested in content. I am interested in art. I am interested in adult material. I am not interested in watching Marvel movies. now. Again, I grew up with a healthy diet of that stuff, but I am now in my late 30s. I do not seek out this sort of like, again, like I've adopted this sort of like anti-nostalgia kind of stance. Um, and I feel like it's necessary. Like, I feel like it's necessary, it's a necessary, not only is it a necessary part of, like, you kind of, like, uh, developing your own taste, but it's a necessary part when it comes to, like, self-assessment, you know? I feel like uh, a lot of people, you know, they never move beyond that. A lot of people love things purely for nostalgic reasons. Um, I'm not saying you're bad for that, but I feel like it stunts your growth. Like, this is just something I personally believe. I feel like people who are hung up on nostalgia and liking things because it helps them relive their childhood are in a sort of suspended animation or an arrested development, right? Uh, uh, where it's like, you don't grow as a person, you know, if you continuously want to... Um, relive your childhood or be a child um and i feel like that's what we're seeing we you know this this we live in an infantilization culture like everything has to be passed through the human resource department all the boxes have to be checked it has to be ethically made product for the public to consume which is naive because under capitalism there is no such thing as an ethically made product this mic that i'm talking in this iphone that i own the food that i eat like everywhere you look the clothes on our backs guaranteed if you go down the line you will find that it is not ethically made. There is some form of exploitation that exists down the chain. Um, and that's something that like we need to come to terms with. I mean, and again, just because you own an iPhone doesn't mean you're complicit necessarily with, you know, um, 
whatever Apple does to create those iPhones. You know, whatever happens and occurs in the Foxconn plants, the horror stories that you hear, you know, um, that doesn't necessarily make us complicit because, again, you live under this system. You know, you live under the system of capitalism. And, like, we all have to kind of participate because it's non consensual. It's not something that you could just opt out of, you know. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that because you participate, because, you know, you have to survive, that that means that you are somehow an advocate for, for the way things are. No, you can advocate for a better system, for a better society, while living under the one that you disagree with. I think that's a very normal thing because we're all kind of doing it. Well, not all of us. Some of us are perfectly fine and think that we live in some sort of like, you know, um, the greatest time ever. Or, you know, you hear those sort of like arguments, usually from libertarian types. But I say all of that to say, and not to get too far off track, um, that the type of movies um, that are released are made, are greenlit, the type of television shows uh, that are out there, um, all of them sort of fall under this umbrella. They fall under this umbrella, um, which is, again, this very sanitized, very safe version of, like, art. But, like, the, the funny thing is, or the thing that I find so kind of, like, contradictory about a lot of this stuff is it will be marketed as, um, it will be marketed as like edgy or it will be marketed as, um, and I kind of hate, I've grown to like, kind of like have a, not really like that term edgy because all of the kind of sh worst, shittiest types of people tend to like, you know, love to describe or talk about what's edgy or, you know, uh, uh and, you know, kind of like, you know, the, the alt-rightish kind of like, again, like even does that even exist anymore? I don't know. But, you know, uh, uh, um, those types, those types that are like, you know, um, art right or right, right wing adjacent, you know, um, um, are just are even neoliberal, you know, um, to a certain in certain context. Right. There's a there's a conversation that exists in both of those kind of spaces about like what is edgy and what is not edgy, right? Um, and it's just funny because these companies, these corporations that, you know, um, own these studios, finance these projects, right? They're not going to give you legitimately controversial or edgy material because it goes against the ethos that they have, which is they need good PR around not only the not only the corporation but around the things that the corporation produces even if those things are unethical right they have to put some sort of like wrapping paper on it and give it some sort of spin to make it seem as if no the the unethical things that are being that are going on are in fact ethical right and that doesn't necessarily relate to like the television and film but in a general sense, right, corporations do that kind of thing. And when it comes to, like, specifically Hollywood and specifically mainstream stuff coming out of the studios today, um, they give you this pseudo sort of, like, pseudo outside the box, pseudo creative, pseudo sort of artistic product. Um, there's only certain things that you're allowed to say, and there's only certain, certain, certain characters that you're allowed to portray, right? Like, again, every, it goes back to this infantilization of 
the culture and of how everyone is treated like babies. Um, so I find myself not going to Netflix to see the newest Netflix movie or to Amazon Prime to see the big, you know, Amazon Prime funded sequel or, you know, or going to the theaters to the new, you know, Marvel film or Disney kind of thing. Now, from time to time, I do see those things, but at the, at the, at the, the age I'm at, and sort of at the place that I'm at and the types of things that appeal to me, um, that has become very r rare when um, I find myself sitting down to kind of watch one of those things. Um, because, again, I am interested in adult art and I like complex things because we you know I, I know this is a cliche you know we live you know we live in a gray world you know not a black and white one it's just it's just that's that's a reality and that's an aspect to life and art is supposed to be a reflection of life right it's supposed to reflect right or usually it's a response to what exist um and i feel like there's a distortion that some people make where they're like oh well art we should create the world that we want to see in art as opposed to the world the way it is um and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing but i do think it is a bad thing when it comes to actually creativity. You know, it's not a bad impulse. You know, it's not a bad impulse to say, yo, I want to create the world that I want, I would like to see, right? But creatively, uh, moving from or creating from that kind of headspace or that kind of mindset, I believe ultimately can result in you coming up with this very rounded off edgeless sort of art or not even art at most times content back to that word i i i feel that that is anti-art the world that we live in there's all sorts of complexities that exist and there's all sorts of subjects that require nuance you know and there's all sorts of conflicting things that exist not only in the world but internally within us as people as human beings there's all sorts of contradictions and uh all sorts of things that we're trying to like work out you know and not everyone is a hundred percent good just like no one is a hundred percent bad within you you know the proverbial you you everyone possesses the capacity to do good and the capacity to do evil, right? And everything in between. It's like a, it's a it's a sliding scale, you know, like and that's the type of that's the type of world that I want to see depicted personally in the art that I I don't even like to use the word consume because again that comes back to that sort of idea of like being a consumer and being under capitalism. I I don't want to consume art. I want to be exposed to art. You know, and people will be like, well, that's semantics, you know, expose, consume. Hey, 
All I know is I would like to be exposed to art and then sort of whatever reaction that I have from being exposed to it is what I benefit from viewing said art. Um, I'm not, a, I don't want to be a consumer. Like, I don't want to just, you know, um, you know, I, I, it's not just for me, like, like, you know, like it's not junk food cinema. Like that's not something I'm interested in. You know, I like all kinds of movies, you know, I like all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, works of you know fiction i mean i read i read across you know genres i read literary stuff i read non-fiction i read you know splatterpunk crime fiction like uh same thing extent movies i'll watch an art film i'll watch a a, 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 sh a sov shot on video sort of backyard horror f movie uh i'll watch a foreign film you name it, like, I don't r really make the distinction between, like, high art, middle brow art, and low art, right? Like, while I acknowledge that those, that those are distinctions that have been made and that certain films uh, get sort of plugged into those categories, I myself, when it comes to sitting down and watching the movies, um, that really is like, they're all, it's all film to me, right? Just like it's all, you know, literature when I'm reading something. Um, and, and, and I feel like, and that, to tie it back into what I was saying about, you know, um, the stuff that's being made today, there is a space now, even now more than ever for a sort of new crop of interesting shit. And it's being made. As I talk, there's people out there making interesting shit. And there's probably already, I know there is, in fact, interesting shit out there. You just have to be willing to go search for it. You cannot rely on the curation of others you cannot rely on the curation of these like streaming platforms you know like not even you know not streaming platforms like netflix or, or even genre ones like shutter you yourself have to be uh your own sort of curator and your own sort of you know you have to do that because it's out there it's out there um more stuff is being made probably now than in any time previously that we're aware of due to the democratization of tools how easy it is to make something now um so there's stuff being made all the time you know i'm, I'm constantly searching i'm finding stuff that was made you know in 2017 or 2020 that's like yo this person is making you know some wild shit and that's another reason why I, ha I made this podcast was to talk about those things. So I will be digging in the past a lot because I love kind of like um, older stuff due to the fact that, again, what I'm talking about, what I started this off with, the idea of like being, you know, avant-garde, you know, like, like you're not going to, I, I love avant-garde shit. You know, I love stuff that's left of center. I love stuff that's, you know, um, doing things that aren't being done in any sort of like mainstream space uh, that's always appealed to me it will always appeal to me you know um so that's the type of things i will seek out you know um and again like there will like there will be a new crop of interesting sort of filmmakers and hopefully you know not all of them will completely sell out <laughs> at some point when they get you know um any sort of notoriety or their work start to get a a recognition and in a, in a sort of a, a broader appeal 
um, beyond just the sort of niche sort of small small circles that they currently exist in, right? Um, and as as someone who who's a screenwriter themselves, you know, I'm a screenwriter. I mean, I don't know if I've mentioned that before. Um, and uh, I've lived, you know, I live in L.A. Well, sorry, I don't live in L.A. <laughs> I lived in L.A. Um, now I travel there. Um, I'm constantly working on stuff. Um, I hope that I don't get, I don't know, I don't want to, and maybe again, this is a champagne problem, right? It's be, it would be a champagne problem, I guess, in, in, in some respects, uh, if this were to happen, but I don't want to be tempted by the establishment. Like I, there's nothing cool about the establishment. You know what I mean? If you make movies or shows for Disney, that is the establishment. You know, I have, and again, I have friends or, co you know, or, or colleagues who, who make Marvel stuff, work at those companies. Hey, I'm not taking any sort of shots at them. I understand, you know, it's a, it's, it, you, you know, it's a creative business. You got to pay your bills. I get it. You know, um, some people, they, they, they want to work on these sort of, uh, these intellectual properties and these things that have already sort of existed because again, nostalgia, remember that, remember that thing that I said before that whole, like be that idea or that notion of being anti nostalgia. I don't because, again, anti-nostalgia. I'm only interested in creating new shit. Like, I'm not interested in um, doing... Like, I love, I love discussing. I mean, obviously, I have a podcast. I love discussing, you know, the works of others and, how, and what it made, what, what kind of impact it had on me or what it made me feel, or what I could, that's one of the most best things, that's one of the most interesting aspects to art for me in general, is like the interpretations, and how you can have different reads, and how you can have, you know, different reactions, and how, like, I love that, that's one of my favorite things about, you know, art, right? But when it comes to, like, actually creating something, right, um, I, I want to create things that are original, you know, and I want to do them um, on my own terms. Um, and I never want to, I never want to aspire to ascend into the ranks of the establishment. Um, none of the, none of the people I'm at, like, you know, um, none of the, none of the sorts of artists or filmmakers or people that I'm inspired by the most. Um, wherever ones who were pro establishment i mean i can think of some examples of filmmakers and people who who did definitely ascend and make stuff make stuff that you would define as by my but what i'm ter what what i'm terming the establishment um there are plenty of people who have made things at the studio level which again you can say that's establishment right um that I, that I respect in terms of like, there's plenty of like films and filmmakers who are like, I respect their shit. Um, but even those films, a lot of times were made with an independent spirit and were made, um, they were battles, you know, they were fights that, that those individuals had to fight, um, at some point in their careers, if not on working on that thing that I like that very thing. Um, or if they kind of establish themselves and they have a level of autonomy and can do what the fuck they want, you know, the few kind of uh, filmmakers that exist in that sort of rarefied air where, you know, like, again, I don't really, I'm not really big on Nolan, but like Nolan exists in that, um, that space, Tarantino, you know, those, those types of filmmakers who can kind of like just make what they want, you know, like, um, again, that I'm not saying that filmmakers the filmmakers that exist that can do that at the studio level and get like that kind of autonomy i'm not saying that they're my favorites i'm not saying that those are the people i like i'm not saying that i'm just simply saying that there are cases and instances of stuff being made at that level 
that I like and that I feel like um, that I Again, it's kind of hard for me. It's kind of hard for me because it's like I grapple with this. I grapple with this all the time where I'm like, you know, I can, I can point to specific films that I'm like, yo, that's a great film. It was made within the studio system, you know, um, cool. But then there's also plenty of them that I'm like, yo, that was made independently. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of films that like started off independent and then they got distributed, you know, are bought and distributed by the studio. Um, I feel like I'm getting off on a tangent here, um, but this whole thing is a tangent. Um, and I am going to talk about a movie, but again, this, this podcast um, is, is, is not just something that like, like it's formless, right? You know, um, I guess I've kind of sort of established a form a little bit because I started it. It's the third episode. We talk about, I talk about a movie, um, but I just felt like Episode three, um, I'm going to get into a little sort of a mini rant about the state of cinema, the state of art, and the state of the world in a general sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know what else to say other than, you know, I like avant I I I like avant-garde shit. Um if you like avant-garde shit, which I assume you might because if you're listening still, then thank you. And also, um yeah. Uh, there's going to be a lot of shit that I bring up. There's going to be a lot of things that will be talked about that I feel like are very much, whether you define them as, uh, or, 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 or view them as avant-garde or not, like, um, it's not really, it doesn't really matter. Um, but they will be, they will, they will, it will be something that I guarantee you probably haven't saw or at the very least, you haven't heard a lot of discussions about. Um, so yeah, with that said, I'm going to stop and we're going to start talking about one of those types of movies. So if I were to pitch you uh, the movie that I'm going to be talking about, uh, you would automatically think there's no way that I want to watch this movie or it. Or if I do want to watch it, there's no way that it's good, or there's no way that that works. Um, the movie I'm talking about is a a Hong Kong film from the '80s that's sort of part Italian giallo, part screwball romantic comedy, with a little bit of. Brian De Palma's uh, Dress to Kill sprinkled in and imagine like the humor of Jackie Chan films just minus the martial arts. Well, then you would have the movie that I'm describing, which is He Lives by Night. From 1982. <laughs> Thank you. 
He Lives by Night is directed by Po Chi Leong. Now, I understand that I probably said that name wrong, so please forgive me um, for my lack of ability to pronounce names correctly. Um, I mean no disrespect. Uh, He Lives by Night. And I'm going to do this sort of a little different than I did with the last episode. Um, Again, this podcast, if you haven't noticed, it's kind of a work in progress and I'm kind of refining as I go. Um, I've listened to plenty of podcasts in in my life, Um, but when it comes to recording many, um, I'm not as experienced. Uh, So I'm definitely going to recap this film but i'm not going to go about recapping it in the same way that i recapped the last film too young to die because i feel like um yeah i felt like i just kind of don't necessarily want to go into that level of a recap where i'm literally walking you through every single beat of the story um i'm still going to give a similar sort of overview it just won't be as uh sort of beat by beat plot point by plot point now um the imdb (laughs) synopsis these are always like varying levels of shit basically uh uh, the imdb synopsis for he lives at night um is a killer wears women's clothing and stalks others that wear fishnet stockings. Again, I don't know who wrote that. That's a terrible synopsis. Um, it does describe what the killer does in this movie, um, but it really gives you no clue what exactly this movie is like. And let me tell you, um, this movie is unlike any other movie I've seen because it has two different tones um that kind of like live next to each other harmoniously it's like this again like this movie really shouldn't work like it has these comedy moments next to these like thriller moments where you see like like literal like murder set pieces that are actually grisly and like they do work as like kind of thrilling sort of like terrifying moments right alongside this sort of goofy again like I described it like Jackie Chan-esque kind of like humor like again it's very screwball um but yet it just sort of works and it's almost like effortless uh that's what really appeals to me about this movie because I really don't know uh, of any sort of other movie that does this like as well as and I've seen, you know, you, there's plenty of like horror comedies. I wouldn't describe this as like a horror comedy. Like, like this is like two different things coexisting at the same time. Like, um, not a blend. It's not even a blend. It's like, again, it shouldn't work. Um, but before I get into like the recap of, you know, the movie and kind of like walk through it and tell you a little bit more about this you know, very unique movie. Um, I will get a little bit into, uh, the background of the filmmaker, the director, uh, again, like, I'm sorry. I know I'm not, I know I'm not saying this name right. Okay. I know that. So again, I apologize to, uh, Mr. Leong. Um, if I butcher your first name, specifically Po Chi, like, I'm not sure how to pronounce the, the, the second following the hyphen, which is C H. I H again, like I'm not sure how to pronounce that. So if I say it in it again, I mean, no offense (laughs) once again. Um, but, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say Mr. Leong, uh, he's, he's part. And I guess this film would kind of fall in under the umbrella of the like Hong Kong new wave because, you know, the Hong Kong new wave is, you know, I think it's like cited is like starting around like the in the late 70s around like 78 79 um and one of like the things about uh the new wave directors were like they all had like 
a, a, a European style education and they were also like influenced by filmmakers um, outside of, you know, China, you know, Hong Kong in and of itself is a, was under British rule for, you know, um, for a long time, up until the very recent, you know, um, up until very recently. Yeah, up until very recently. So, um, uh, but one of the things about like the, the quote unquote Hong Kong new wave were like these were these filmmakers who were making these films that, you know, were influenced by foreign films to them. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because, and again, like, uh, the director of He Lives by Night, um, definitely falls into that category because Leong was, um, actually born in England. Um, and he went to the London Film School. Uh, and at a certain point, um, upon his graduation, um, apparently he was at the BBC as like a film editor, like, and worked on like, you know, different productions um some and some you know tv series and then he went to hong kong um and apparently he went to hong kong and started working on um television shows um before he decided to make his first film um i think in 1976 uh and that that's called uh jumping ash which i definitely want to see um because it sounds like it's very uh well, it sounds like it's right up my alley. It's set in like the drug underworld. Hmm, interesting. Uh yeah. So that's a little bit of the background of of the director and sort of like uh the Hong Kong New Wave. Um now again, like there are a lot of uh notable filmmakers and films that came from sort of this new wave. Uh obviously, you know, John uh John Woo, you know, you know, Chow Young Fat uh was a uh, you know i acted in a lot of these you know sort of hong kong new wave films um and even like you know you had it they had like the first wave and then they had like a second wave you know um were were filmmakers like uh like uh uh wong kar wai was was part of in you know, johnny toe uh you know um these were guys from like the second wave uh i guess they considered that would have begun in like the 80s, you know, um, and I'm not quite sure if this qualifies as second wave or first wave in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, the Hong Kong new wave movement. But uh, I do think that this film totally falls under the criteria that would make it uh, part of that movement. Um, now, back to the movie. So. He lives by night. <laughs> what can I say about this movie? Well, I can do a better job than a synopsis. I mean, I understand that that's a very low bar, but I can do a better job than a synopsis. So basically, uh, the movie opens um, with this kind of like great sort of like uh, casino in a casino, which it's like really like there's like women, there's like people on stage and there's like women literally coming out of a slot machine like like it's like uh and there's like neon lights and like it, it really makes an impression like like the cinematography is like uh very like oh like they're shooting the shit out of this movie like right on go and then you sort of notice like there's a person like we're looking through their pov as they're watching um one of the women on stage uh dance and she has on uh you know these um fishnet stockings and she's like peeling them off and showing her legs. It's almost like a like a burlesque kind of performance, right? It's in neon lights and everything. And then um we see a scene with her leaving. Now this is a white woman by the way. Um and she's which is this cast is all uh Chinese. This is like the only non-Chinese person is in this opening scene. I mean, in terms of like a like there's other people within the casino who are also like Anglo, but like this woman specifically in this opening scene is like a white woman. I don't I don't know um i don't know if she's french whatever but she's definitely a white woman and she's walking out of the casino afterwards with a man um and i guess it's her boyfriend he's an asian man chinese man and um she ends up leaving um the casino with him and at a certain point you know they say their goodbyes and she's walking by herself and she walks through this alley you know again 
opening of a movie that's <laughs> every bad horror movie, right? But this movie's not bad. Um, let me take a sip of my beverage here. Hmm. Again. So, she's walking through this alley, and there's these uh, tarps hung up, these colorful tarps. And, like, she sees the shadow of someone. It looks like a woman. And, like, she's looking around, and, like, she can see, like, the silhouette through these tarps. And then someone starts slicing these tarps, slicing them with a razor. And she's, like, getting caught up in them. And now, this scene is, like, visually reminiscent of a Dario Argento film, specifically uh, Tenenbrae. And like the the funny thing about it is, um, there's an image in this opening murder because she gets murdered by this person, um, where she's like l screaming through this like torn uh, cloth, like this tarp, right? She's screaming like as and it's a, it's like a very I'll, I'm gonna make the co uh, the uh, the art for this episode the the image that I'm talking about. Um, because it's very, like, again, when you see it, those familiar with an Argento film, and specifically Tenenbrae, will automatically notice what I'm talking about. Um, which comes back to this, like, giallo kind of, like, uh, 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 this is a Hong Kong movie that is definitely inspired by these Italian giallo films, um, by this opening murder sequence here. Uh, but, and the funny thing about it is, these, Tenenbrae and this movie came out in the same year. So it's like, you, which begs the question, um, was who influenced who, you know, because if this movie came out in 82, uh, they were probably shooting in 81, um, maybe even shooting simultaneously. So the, I, the notion that one is copying the other is kind of like, probably not true. It's just like, maybe it's, or may, you know, I, I'm not quite sure, but like, again, like when you see Tenenbrae or if you've saw it and you see this opening, uh, murder sequence, which is, Ex, it's like expertly shot it's it looks again like if you just saw this murder scene specifically because it's it you only see the woman this this white woman being murdered right you would if if you only saw this part of the movie you would think you're watching an italian giallo film right but then immediately after she's murdered it cuts to uh, a kitchen and we meet uh our main character uh sissy um and she's cooking food uh, in the well. Her her roommate, I guess, is cooking some food, and she walks in out of out of the shower in a towel, right? Um, and immediately you notice, like, oh, this is not an Italian giallo film. <laughs> like, it, this is not. This is clearly a Hong Kong film, just by not only the characters, but like just the setting. It looks very Hong Kong. And then we cut after this introduction, and we meet her. It's brief. It's just a brief, quick introduction. We don't kind of have any context of who she is. Uh, we cut to the the murder scene, and we meet the cops. Now the cops consist of um, this guy Lousy. His name, his nickname is Lousy Wong, um, <laughs> which uh, again, Sissy knows him. So uh, apparently, that's how we figure out like they went to school together, and everyone calls him Lousy Wong for some fucking reason. And Lousy Wong um, is a cop, and he works for Dragon. And Dragon is this kind of like plump, kind of silly looking. Um, I don't know if he's a lead inspector because everyone in the police force salutes him. He's like, and he's definitely Lousy Wong's boss. So he's like a head of, he's, I guess he's, is he the head of homicide? I don't quite understand how Hong Kong police work. But at the murder scene, we are introduced to Lousy Wong and Dragon. And uh, Sissy comes walking through and she sees Lousy. <laughs> and she calls him, hey, Lousy Wong. And he's like, don't use my nickname or whatever. And she's just kind of like, you know, um, walking through, and again, this, this is very, like, uh, it's, it's very light, light in tone, like, it's very, like, when you watch this, you're like, what, like, I just saw a murder, and this seems very, like, it's almost, it's comedic, it's like a screwball comedy, and, um, she's there at the murder scene asking questions, and, um, we can already see that, like, uh, Dragon, specifically, she doesn't even think Dragon's his boss, she thinks like he's like the the. She's just, uh, she asked w w Lousy if like they've caught is he the suspect, and he's like, man, that's my boss, and he shows him. <laughs> he, uh, Dragon shows Sissy his badge, and it's like she's like, oh well, sorry about that, you know. And, and it's real like again, it's real quirky, right? And then like, uh, she leaves, and like we can see that like automatically like that Dragon has a thing for her, like Dragon is you know Lousy's boss, and like. 
he just makes the comment like yo she's a you know like i like her like more or less something to the effect of like you know he's interested in this woman right um so we open with this grizzly murder scene then we're introduced to these sort of like you know screwball sort of like uh uh you know very very like light-hearted characters even though these are cops investigating a murder and sissy is you know just this young woman but we follow that scene and we 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 see sissy walking into uh her job and and she goes into an office and and we see her enter like a studio and then we see her start to be like a dj on a radio show that is very popular because we see uh, a scene of someone listening who has pictures of Sissy everywhere, like all around their room. Like, you know, like, and it's like we were looking from their POV and it's somebody who is super obsessed with her. And as she's speaking, we're hearing her um, talk. And she has like sort of one of those, you know, um, it's one of those late night sort of like uh, uh, radio programs where you know she takes callers and she dedicates songs to people and has questions or whatever and as she's like playing music and queuing up a song or whatever um we are list- we are seeing like not only do we 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 see this person this un this this faceless person we don't know who they are yet we see them listening but then we see uh the cops again we see dragon specifically walking back uh th- well he's walking through the hallway at you know the police station or whatever and he's listening on a little handheld radio to sissy and like uh she's reading a letter a love letter that someone um has wrote to her fans or whatever uh and as she, and as she's reading it um we see that like dragon is like listening along laughing and just really really like Again, he's clearly like enamored with this. He's a fan. Like he's not only a fan, he's like into her. Um but at this point like he's not even aware that it's the same woman that he saw down at the crime scene. He just is like this is a fan of like he's a fan of this radio show, right? So he's like he goes into his office and um he kicks some there's some already some there's some cops in there. He kicks them out. He shuts the door and he's like listening and then um apparently uh I don't know. It's 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 I don't know if he wrote her a letter, uh, but it seems like he wrote her an anonymous letter and she's reading it and she dedicates a song to, to, the, to the person, you know, and he's like really like happy that she's dedicating this song. It's like, you know, I love you for 365 days a year, something, you know, some song, some very poppy song. She's dedicating it to him. So he's like literally there listening, smoking a pipe, grinning. Like, again, this is like very comedic. And then in comes Lousy uh, with a report, sort of like interrupting him. And then you kind of see uh, like him sort of uh, trying to like ignore him while he listens to Sissy over the, over the radio. And Lousy mentions at this time that it's the same woman. He's like, hey, you're you really like the show. Like, you know, that's her. That's Sissy. So he's like, what you mean? That's Sissy? And he's like, call her. And he's like literally gives him the phone as he's making lousy caller. Um, so and again, this is establishes the dynamic of like a uh, dragon trying to uh, pretty much court sissy because the whole movie he's like trying to get with her and he's trying to use his uh, his subordinate, the cop that his he's his, 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 you know, his subordinate because he's the boss of uh, the guy that, you know, the cop that, that works or reports directly to him has, you know, the relationship with sissy because. They went to school together. Um, so as we as we get that call, we're, 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 or he's trying to call in, she actually takes another call. Um, and it's from the guy. We actually see the guy's face. Uh, the guy with all of the pictures of her up on the wall. Like he's obsessed or whatever, right? Um, and he's sort of a, he's a red herring because immediately when you see this guy, you think, oh, this must be the killer. Like, because he's like a freak and he's like obsessed with this woman and he's like he's on the phone with her um because this is why the song is playing he's called into the radio station and he's like basically saying creepy shit to her and she she hung she hangs up on him ultimately he gets pissed off and i think he like chops up some shit on top of the radio it's like again it's real over the top real kind of like i don't know mannered or whatever um and you 
kind of were led to think like, well, maybe this guy's like dangerous or whatever. But, but immediately following that, um, we go to a scene with uh, two characters outside of a convenience store, and <laughs> it's funny because it's like they have on like a uh, uh, there's it's a it's a girl and a guy, and the and they have like face makeup on, um, like. <laughs> and the girl makes the comment like oh you look just like kiss then that'll give you a, a sense of like what kind of face makeup these two people have on specifically the guy though has like this face his face is half painted with like a star over his eye and again like it's just it's very like 80s but also very like very specifically chinese and very well, by chinese i mean very specifically hong kong specific like um like it's like almost like a, 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 a Hong Kong interpretation of like a American like sort of 80s sort of rock kind of nostalgia, but with their own kind of spin on it. Right. Which is very um, common in these sort of like new wave Hong Kong films. Right. Um, you see a lot of that. Um, and again, like Hong Kong is what I know about it, you know, and I, I'm not an expert, but what I know about that time and what I know about, like, again, them being under sort of like British rule. It's a very you like you see like this sort of like it's a unique kind of culture because it's like it's a mishmash of like like uh you know uh eastern and western sort of like sensibilities in this kind of like unique sort of hong kong uh uh uh, uh way that's like different from mainland china but um the scene happens these these two kids walk into this convenience store and trying to hold it up but there's a cop in there that we and he kind of like pulls a gun on them um and again the scene is very silly like uh but they managed to like uh grab the creepy guy that we saw who was on the phone um again he's looking at a stalking we think he's the killer like he's but like they literally grab him um and use him as like a, a, a hostage to get the cop to like drop his gun and then they get they get away and they kind of leave this guy. So immediately you're like, this guy's not even threatening. He got like taken as a hostage by this woman and this small man. And as they, they and cause he, I didn't mention he's a very kind of like short guy, little, like he's non-threatening again. Like this is regardless that this, these people are kind of like supposed to be punks or whatever. Like they, it's clearly like comedic again. Like there's this tonal thing that I'm, that's constantly like this film is doing. It's like, it's very, I, I, you just have to watch it to see it because I'm, I'm telling you like these tones i know i know how i'm saying i know how this sounds but these tones exist they coexist uh next to each other and it just works but okay so they get out of there they jump in uh this car of this woman and we can't see the woman like we can only see that like it her kind of like her back's to us and she's sort of in silhouette and they take her car to like escape the convenience store or whatever and what happens is, as they're driving away in the car, the woman's in the back seat, and the the man is the girl's driving, and the man is like literally like groping the woman in the back seat um, as they're driving, and he f goes for her breast, and his face is shocked because there's it's, there's no breast there, and um, the woman in the back seat throws him out of the car, um, and then it's just the woman and the woman in the back seat and the woman driving doesn't realize that she's her 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 partner in crime literally was thrown out she assumes that he threw the woman out woman out and she's like what? oh you threw her out and then she looks back and she sees in the rear view she sees it's not and then a, the woman in the back wraps a silk a silk the, the 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 silk fishnet around her throat and strangles her and the car crashes and you realize this is the killer and then we see this woman exit the car and walk back through the, the up, walk up the sidewalk. And ultimately we follow this woman um, into her apartment. And we see, we hear Sissy over the radio actually reporting the murder, like after it's happened. Like there's a woman that was found strangled in her car. And as the radio plays and, and we hear Sissy kind of like talk about the murder, we watch the woman sort of like, uh, uh, take her makeup off and ultimately take her wig off and then of course obviously it's not a woman it's in fact a man dressing up as a woman now somehow 
And again, it's a trope that is very uh, much of the, the era, the 80s specifically, of making sort of like a, a transvestite uh, killer. You know, um, and again, and there's a lot of like problematic things about that for sure. Like, let's be honest, like it's, 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 it's very like, you know, um, and again, I use the term transvestite because um, the killer is not trans. In, in the sense of like the killer is a man who so who identifies as a man who is um a straight man um who dresses up as a woman um and kills women um and again like somehow this movie is far less um offensive when it comes to like the portrayal of this like trans killer uh than like Again, dressed to kill, which is something I mentioned earlier. It's like far less like it just handles it. This movie does a lot of things that like shouldn't work. But again, it just it just does it in a way that's like like not so sleazy. And, and it's, again, it, it goes to like it, it goes to like a, a sensibility thing. Maybe it's a sensibility thing. So anyways, we get to see who the real killer is and we get to see. And, 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 in, and in this way, it's not a Giallo film. Again, it just has the aesthetics of the Giallo film, specifically when the kills happen, the murder sequences. It's like you could take the murder sequences that happen in this in this movie, literally out of this movie and drop them into an Italian Giallo and they would fit perfectly. Um, but after this kill happens, we're introduced to the killer. The, we see the killer's identity and we find out, you know, a little bit more about the killer, but we immediately go to uh sissy back at the uh, radio station and she's calling Wong lousy. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep calling him lousy. It's a funny nickname. And that's what the character is called. Lousy Wong. Um, she calls lousy and she says that she's worried because of like the murder that she wants. She, can you guys pick, can you pick her up? And of course, Wong gives the phone to, uh, dragon to and said can we you know because he knows dragon likes her um and then dragon um he tells her to go to hell <laughs> but the reason dragon tells her to go to hell is because uh something i left out was that uh when she gets through after she talks to the creepy guy who's obsessed with her she does get wong does get through to her and puts dragon on the phone um and she tells dragon to go to or she tells wong that he can go to hell because Wong is literally trying to like hook her up again. This is so weird that the cop is like trying, like, again, he is like the lead inspector trying to hook up with this woman. But again, it's just, <laughs> I feel like when I describe this movie, you're going to be like, what is he? What? But yeah. But so, uh, we afterwards, she's leaving her, the radio station and she's like looking around and she gets scared. Um, but it's uh, but the cops have shown up. Like they show up. Like Dragon and Wong show up, and there's two other cops there. Uh, for some 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 odd reason, I don't know. Um, and they end up going to dinner, um, with Sissy. So the two cops, and actually it's four of them because a woman cop comes along. Um, and she's not ever kind of uh seen again after this scene. But it's but it's really just important for the scene for the comic moment of the scene right so there's so sissy is out to dinner and the main point of this dinner is that like dragon is trying to get close to sissy because <laughs> this is this is one of the subplots or one of the main plots fuck a subplot um outside of the killer this is the main plot that dragon this again this this short he's this chubby sort of like short funny um kind of like reminds me of sammo hung in not in like the way he looks, he doesn't look like Sammo Hung, um, but just comedically sort of like he gives a Sammo Hung like sort of comedic performance in a way. Um, um, they're also both sort of like, you know, chubby kind of like um, Chinese guys, but like I'm not, you know, I'm not like I'm not saying like in any way that like they're all the same. I'm not like, come on, let's be real. Like. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not I'm not that guy. Um, but that is a comparable performance in terms of like, again, um, the humor 
that the dragon character, who the actor, I believe his name is Kent Chang. Uh, Kent Chang plays dragon. Um, and he's just, again, like, he manages to be like this, like, cop who's like, <laughs> his performance is like, if, if his performance doesn't work, then the movie doesn't work. Right. Um, and the same thing goes with, 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 with Sissy as well. Like, they manage to like be so like <laughs> back like funny and like at the same time it's like you just have to you just have to you just have to watch this movie like again like at the end of this uh seek this movie out it is it is not um available on any streaming websites that i know of so it's kind of hard to find but i found it it's out there trust me um but the point of the scene is really it's a comedic scene he's trying to get to, to he's trying to have her uh to eat by himself so he actually sends because again all of these cops are like uh his subordinates so he sends the woman cop home he tries to send lousy home but lousy's not having it he's like yo i haven't ate yet so they have this scene where they like ordering food and like they keep ordering food and they're literally stacking these bowls of food over and over again as they keep ordering shit and it's again it's really slapstick over the top and they have like towers of these bowls <laughs> and they like start eating the food and like ultimately like it's a funny scene it's not really uh it, it, i would say this like none of these scenes none of these scenes are important but yet without them the movie kind of like isn't like, I don't know. It's like, it's weird. It's like, um, like, again, when I describe this movie, like I said, on paper, it doesn't work. But even when you describe it, it really kind of doesn't work. But this whole scene plays out, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's pretty funny. And you kind of get a sense of like the dynamic immediately. Like, um, because it's like, you've got Lousy, who's kind of like the third wheel, who's kind of like, almost doesn't want Dragon to hook up with Sissy. And Sissy clearly isn't like, trying to be with dragon but at the same time you're kind of like sissy's like not sort of i don't know like it's like you get the sense that like she's not like completely repulsed by the guy but like but she's definitely not into the guy but she's definitely like a nice person and like she knows again she knows lousy and there's like a lot of scenes where like lousy's like the third wheel and like dragon is trying his best to impress sissy and like this is the first real scene um where you see that in the movie where it's just these two like or well, them these three but specifically sissy and dragon sort of like him coming on to her and she kind of like telling him like you don't have really have a chance but it's not done in a way that's like it's still it's still very like lighthearted, like in tone you never feel like at any time that like dragon is like being too creepy even though he's being thirsty because trust me dragon my man's thirsty he's thirsting right um but it just walks this line tonally that's just like pitch perfect for like the type of like tone it's going for only with the comedy like again like when it comes to the murder uh subplot or if you want to call it a subplot i still don't believe it's a subplot i feel like both are the main plots and they again they, they sort of like coexist in the same movie it's very different um, and again, I'm, I know I've said that multiple times. Um, take a take a drink every time I repeat myself. I just took one. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be um, not playing that game because I want to finish this podcast. Um, but anyways, um, after uh, the dinner. Um, Dragon offers to drive Sissy home and then he literally has to pay Lousy to not come along with him. Because Lousy's like, I don't have any money. I need cab fare or whatever. And, and there's, again, it's another comedic scene where he keeps getting Dragon to give him more money until finally he leaves. And then he does. So they leave together and, like, they're driving along. And um, there's a moment where Sissy tells Dragon she wants a newspaper. And Dragon being so eager to, like, do stuff for her, he's like, I'll get it. You just stay here. And he kind of pulls the car off to the side on the road. And he runs across the road to get her a newspaper. <laughs> and like while he's getting a newspaper uh, a parking attendant walks up to the car to starts to write a ticket and as dragons gra dragons getting the newspaper he tells the newspaper man like i guess there's a story uh and sissy's in, like something to do with sissy's uh, radio show or something and he points at it and says this is my girlfriend uh, again this is 
<laughs> it's like his his girlfriend like automatically dude is again dude your man's thirsty but as he comes back he sees the 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 cop writing the ticket and immediately she salutes him and she apologizes and she get, he takes the ticket from her and then like she runs off and she's like sorry sir goodbye sir sorry sir and like again it just establishes that like dragon is like higher up in the like police force and like these people and it's a running joke throughout the whole movie where like he's doing goofy shit and like the cops that he's that like he's the boss of have to like sort of like acknowledge that he's doing shit that he's not supposed to be doing but at the same time maintain respect because they have to you know he's he's their boss um and there's literally another scene that follows that really like literally because he's trying to impress sissy Again, I have to stress to you, like, you're like, well, what does this have to do with, like, no, no, because this is legitimately part of the movie. Like, there's two movies in one. So he's, like, driving along with her after that, and, like, some people pull up at a light next to him, um, and they want to race. They don't know he's a cop, and he wants to impress Sissy. So they're sitting at the light, so he's, he decides to race him. Because, again, Dragon is doing whatever he can to impress her. He's a cop, but he's, like, doing whatever he can. And, by the way, a cab, by the way, all cops are bastards. But whatever. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he's racing this, this other couple uh, in the car and, and he ends up like speeding um, and the other car is beating him until he like shows him some handcuffs and the guy realizes he's a cop and he slows down. But Dragon blows past the speed trap and he's pulled over again by cops and then they see it's him <laughs> and they immediately salute him again. And you have one of these scenarios again where they're like, uh, uh, you're my boss, but like you were speeding, but like, how do they, again, it's, it's just funny. Like, it's just, uh, and it's like, and, and it's one of those things where it's like, what movie am I watching? Because again, remember this movie started with like a brutal murder, like a, a giallo style sort of sl uh, slashing and strangulation of a woman. Um, and it cuts to this stuff. Uh, <laughs> but this scene, happens okay and the murder subplot comes back in uh shortly thereafter because we see the killer now again we've shown the killer's face but we see the killer at his job now apparently he's a shoe salesman um but we see two kind of like upper crusty sort of upper class uh women trying on shoes at the shoe store um and they're talking about uh well the woman there's two women and one of one is one is married and the other one is uh her friend and we know the woman's married because they're talking about her husband and they're talking about how uh uh when her husband's out of town you know she she likes to fool around basically um and one of the uh, the shoe salesman that initially is helping him goes in the back and we see the killer in the back and he's like hey can you go help these women they're getting on my fucking nerves get them out of here basically um <laughs> Uh, it's sort of the humor of this movie um so he comes out and they see him and they're like he's bringing and they say oh you're he's cute right and he's put kind of puts on the charm or whatever and they kind of like you're like yo yo like he's cute remember and she's already established that like she likes to like fool around or whatever um but as so he pulls out a sh he, he pulls out a pair of pumps for the women to try on both women put their legs up for some reason um i guess they both want to try the shoe on but one woman has on stockings and the other woman has on fishnet silk stockings, just like the ones that we saw the woman in the beginning of the movie had that got strangled to death. And when our killer sees those stockings, immediately you can tell he's like, a, he's overcome. Like this, the, 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 the fishnets, these white fishnet stockings are his, when he sees a woman with these on, he has the uncontrollable urge to like, want to kill them. Like, again, it's tied into this like, sort of like sexual gratification thing or something. Right. And we do get to find out more about that. Right. We'll find out why exactly, uh, where this all stems from. Um, but so the women leave, right? Um, and they're like, they flirt with him or whatever. And he says like, oh, I'll, you know, they want the shoes or whatever. And he says, well, we, we send the shoes to your house. So after the scene, 
we see it's nighttime and the women are going back to the, the, the married woman's house. She's taking her friend back. You know, again, her husband's not there, so her friend's just staying over with her, whatever. And they come back home. Um, at the same time, we, there's, a, there's like a little a superimposed image of our killer. And he's like standing there, um, superimposed over like the outside of the building that the woman lives in. And it like does a transition of him in his like work outfit with his glasses into his, uh, in, into drag and him as a woman, um, superimposed. It's a kind of like a, it's, a, it's somewhat hokey, but sort of kind of like interesting looking like at the same time, the way it's like visually on screen, the way they portray it. Um, as if, you know, again, it's just to I'll just establish that like, okay, he's coming after these women. Like, because he's back in, he's back dressed up. Again, a la sort of Norman Bates, dressed to kill. He's donned uh, his woman's uh, disguise because he's going to murder these women. Now, the funny thing about this scene is the way it plays out is, it's very kind of like, uh, there's an artfulness in the way they craft it because they establish that the two women are sort of like joking around and specifically the 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 friend is always scaring the married woman so she literally does a series of scares while they're home to sort of like throw the audience off like so initially like the married woman is carrying like a bloody mary through her house or whatever and her friend like slashes at her off screen and you think you just see a woman's hand you think oh shit it's the killer already but it's not it's her friend she scared her ha ha whatever okay and then her friend says something about she's going to take a shower and she's like, all right, well, cool, I'm going to change. And, and, and then they go upstairs. Um, and as the, uh, as the married woman is undressing, um, we see sort of outside POV, uh, the killer, kind of just moving around the house, moving towards uh, a sliding glass door and peeping inside, seeing um, the married woman who's now in a, like, undergarment sort of nighty thing, right? Um, and she's downstairs. And she's like, she grabs like a feather duster because she's going to try and get back her friend. Again, it sets up this in a sort of like, because uh, uh, it's always, this, the good thing about this movie is always trying to keep the audience off guard, right? So the, we see the friend upstairs getting undressed and like about to take a bath, a, a bubble bath or whatever. And then we watch as uh, the woman creeps upstairs and through the bedroom into the bathroom and she goes to the shower curtain, rips it back. And then we see the girl with a silk handkerchief it looks like a stocking wrapped around her neck and she looks like she's being like as she's almost dead then you're like oh shit and she screams but then you realize oh it's a joke she's just i was just kidding you again she gets her friend again so it's again it's a second fake out so it's like two fake outs like to establish like oh like what the fuck's going on now the reason that they do that though isn't the typical reason so usually they do the fake outs right uh, so that like when the final kill happens, like it catches the audience off guard. That's not why they do it here. They do it here for a really interesting reason, which is the woman comes back downstairs, right? And the killer is now inside. We see because we, the killer's POV, he's like, it's like moving around the house, hi hiding and shit, right? Um, but he's creeping out and she's like making eggs or something. She's cooking on the stove and she notices the killer. But the killer is in a blue dress and the wig, similar hairstyle to her friend. So she turns off the light. She thinks it's her friend trying to scare her for a third time. So that's what's unique about it. So it's like, again, it's not the fake outs weren't for the audience. The fake outs were for this. So it's like she knows the killer is there, but she doesn't know that it's the killer. So she's sneaking up trying to scare the, the killer as he's trying to surprise her. So the whole scene plays out. He's creeping along. He's got his razor out because he likes to, like I have established, like he shows in the very beginning, a box cutter um, in the initial murder scene. Again, very giallo West, the way they show the box cutter in the beginning. Well, he has the box cutter out and he's creeping around the house and she knows where he is. She thinks that he's going to get the drop on her, but the whole time she's trying to get the drop on him. Now, both of them are totally unaware. And again, like it, it, it part, it's part of the, co the comedic aspect of the scene, right? Which is, makes it really funny, but again, this movie's so cool because of the tonal shifts. So it's like she jumps out, ultimately, and scares the guy. Um, 
and like literally starts hitting him with the with the feather the feather duster uh and and he's like what the fuck and then and then she looks she gets a good look and she realizes oh shit that's not my friend and then she screams and realizes she's really in danger and he drops he had actually when she's hitting him he actually drops the box cutter and that's when the box cutter clinks on the floor and she kind of looks at it and then looks at him and realizes that's when she's like oh shit and she runs and then the actual pursuit begins where she's in terror and she's like trying to run away from the killer in her house um and again the tonal shift at that point is like it's just masterful in a way because it's like it went from like it being funny to like it literally being like a serious like thriller moment so she's moving through her house like running up the steps or uh, to get away from this guy this intruder which again she probably i'm not even it's not quite established if she knows it's it's a man or if it's a woman right but she's hiding and she's like turns the lights off in her living room she tries to she tries to make a phone call but immediately the killer steps into the room so she leaves the phone off the hook and she goes to hide behind the couch and it becomes again a cat and mouse sequence where like he's getting close to her and she's running and like he almost gets her and he almost doesn't get her multiple times in fact she gets he cuts her one time with the razor um and she manages to like escape and run up the steps um but on the steps he grabs her leg and cuts her again um and so she's like bleeding but she manages to like escape him up the steps and her friend the whole time is in is in is in the is in the bubble bath taking a bath um and she she runs in like her friend singing a song uh which is another thing they show the woman humming um killing me softly the uh uh uh, uh and it's funny cuz it's like off it's like off beat off tune and you're hearing this like um chinese woman like sing or hum this song sort of off tune and then you then in the same like sequence or after the sequence you hear the killer singing killing them softly killing me softly with his song and it's just so like weird because the way they sing it is like sort of like off tune and it's like the one sort of like uh sort of like american uh like musical reference in the film and it just again it's like again this this film has so many like interesting little weird kind of cool aspects to it <laughs> but anyways she's running through the house she's bleeding her friend doesn't know that anything's happening. She's singing to herself until she runs into the to the bathroom, bloody, like literally. And she p- leans up against the edge of the tub, and she's reaching out towards her friend. And she's and her friend's shocked, and she's like, "Oh my god!" But part of the part of the uh, curtain is like halfway closed, so if you walk into the bathroom, you can't see who's in the tub. But she's literally leaning on the edge of the tub, looking at her friend, like bleeding and like asking for help right when the killer walks in. So the killer walks in and sees her and slices her back and her and like literally like blood splatters against like the curtain and on her friend's face. And then he starts to pull her by her two legs out of the out of the bathroom into the other room. And she's screaming and her friend is frightened she's terrified and like she's terrified like literally she's looking out she sees there's blood a trail of blood leading from the uh porcelain tile up to the bathtub out to the room and her friend is crying and she's like hearing her friend get murdered and it's again this is like literally terrifying And, and we see in the other room the killer pulls out the fishnets and chokes her strangles her to death and we hear her just gagging and her friends crying and then like she we see her just take her last breath and her dead body's there laying there and her friend is like completely silent now the killer has no fucking idea that she's in there and he walks back into the bathroom and she ducks underneath the bubbles because she was taking a bubble bath and he he walks up to the bathtub and like cleans his hands off a little bit he's singing again he's singing killing me softly it's so weird this man dressed in a, a woman and he's singing killing me softly this woman's hiding and then she like comes up out the water and like sits back against the wall so she's still covered by the the curtain right and she can hear the man's taking a piss he's standing up pissing um she's not she can't see him and he can't see her 
but he's taking a piss standing up, which becomes significant. Um, fully, fully in, fully in woman, in woman garb, dressed up, taking a piss. She's just trying to be as quiet as she can, right? Um, while this is happening, you could see her like literally struggling. She's like covered in soap, soap suds, like completely like trying to like literally biting her fingers like while the while the killer is singing to himself again singing killing me softly wiping himself off with the towel um and you think oh shit is he gonna see this woman um and he wipes his hands off checks himself out in the mirror walks out of the room and the woman like she never sees this woman. she never sees him and the woman like when she knows he's gone she comes out and she sees her friend dead on the floor and obviously she, you know she's overtaken with grief and she's like calling her friend's name and like her friend's friend won't respond because her friend's dead. And it's, again, it's a very, as funny as the scene was initially when it started, when he surprised her, it's like completely dark. Right. And then we see him come back home and he's walks back in dressed, fully dressed as a woman and then cuts to the radio. Susie reporting, reporting the murder after it's happened. And then he's back in his regular sort of like, out of drag and he's smoking a cigarette listening to the radio broadcast about how another murder happened a woman was strangled with her with a uh fishnet again and she's saying you know over the radio um like it's the same person what's wrong with this man um who are you what you must hate women you must have been and here's funny 2021 um she says uh, Susie calls him a cuckold. She said, I bet it's because your wife has made you a cuckold, which in 2021 is really funny because the word cuck has become part of like the lexicon um, because of like, you know, people on the right and like people have adopted this term cuck. Uh, but it uses this moment um, as him listen, ha- as the killer is listening to Susie um, for the flashback. And we get, uh, we get to find out exactly why the killer kills women in this fashion and it shows a scene where um the killer is telling his wife goodbye in the car and uh she's waving goodbye and she's standing outside uh and she see he sees a woman walk up and the woman waves and i guess it's his wife's friend right and the wife holds hands with the woman and they run off and they're both waving to him and she drives away. Then we cut to the bedroom and we see the woman in bed naked, like with a pillow covering her and she's smiling. And then we see a leg lift up, boom, and we see the, the stocking, the fishnet stocking. And then we realize, oh shit, the, the woman takes the brawl off and we realize it's a man. So the whole thing is, and it's not really kind of clear if this is like a man like who she's seeing, like she's definitely cheating on her husband right but it's not quite clear from the flashback right that the man that she's cheating on her husband with is it like clearly the husband doesn't know it's a woman and clearly that's the point right and we're but it's not clear if like he's just doing this as a way to like fool the husband and think it's my friend or whatever but it's really him and he's just in disguise and like when he goes away he's screwing it or if it's like a thing if like it's an aspect to this um man, I don't know, I don't know the guy's pronouns, <laughs> but like, it's, a, it's an aspect of this person's character, right? Like, as if like, is cross-dressing part of it or not? It's not really quite established, but the husband ends up coming back, the killer, because he forgets something. And he's looking through um, some papers or whatever, um, and he sees a box cutter, and he picks up the box cutter. Then he hears some noise upstairs, and he starts walking around and he looks, he sees some clothes, like I said, discarded piece of clothing on the floor. He looks up then he takes a peek through the door and he sees his wife nude with the friend on top of him, on top of her. And it's like, at this point, she still has the wig on, right? But they're looking at each other and she pulls the wig off and you see clearly it's a guy and they're having sex, right? And she's like hugging him. And so he, then we see the, the husband hands subtly creep in to the frame as the two of them are um you know having sex and the hand creeps in and we see the box cutter and the box cutter clink clink click you know out comes the blade the wife looks up surprised he grabs the man by the face slits his throat then he grabs his wife and strangles her with the fishnet stocking and like uh 
that is sort of uh, the origin story behind where he begun to do this. So, like, it shows him laying in between both of them. Like, uh, the wife on, like, his right side on her back, dead, with the pantyhose or the silk fishnets wrapped around her neck, covered in a blanket. And to the left of him, the uh, lover in, like, some speedo draws <laughs> uh, with his throat slit. And he's in the middle of them both, kind of on his back, staring up and then looking to his wife. And he's got the part of the uh, stocking in his hand. And he's, like, fucking around with it, kind of, like, smiling a little bit. And, and then you see, like, a scene of, like, him. And it looks like it may be him in an insane asylum um but that's like the only glimpse we get of it we see him in like kind of like a cell with like with a barred window and he's like by himself um but immediately it cuts right back to um him in his apartment and sissy talking over the radio and she mentions you know like again like judging from what he's done like she calls him like a cuckold like she's like you're a cold blooded psychopath and he gets pissed and he throws his beer and he turns off the radio. So at that point, we've already established that like Sissy is on the killer's radar, right? But again, like this is still a separate, a separate storyline. But it, it's again, these storylines sort of simultaneously just play themselves out until they ultimately intersect. As I take another sip of my drink. So at this point, we sort of get a little bit of the backstory of the killer. but. Just to just to add, there's another point where like after this we see him walking in the hallway, and there's a little girl in the hallway, and she calls him uncle. So we assume it. I don't know if it's literally his niece or not, but she's like uncle or whatever, and she wants to like talk to him, and she like bumps into him, and he drops uh his box cutter, and when he does to pick it up, he notices that the little girl has on fishnet white socks that are like pulled up to like above her calf but like stop right below the knee right and the moment that he sees the fishnets you can see him he's overcome it's like he can't once he sees those things he can't control himself and you watch him raise the box cutter up as he's looking but the but his niece i don't know if it's actually his niece the little girl she grabs like a a piece of paper out of the bucket that's in the hallway and she's like look and he stared, and this is why she was, she wanted to show him a picture uh, that she drew. And she, you know, like with crayon or whatever. And like, he looks at the picture and that like, it freezes him, it stops him. And you just, he's looking at the picture and she's like, I wanted to show you this or whatever. And it's like, you could tell, like you could see he's fighting. Like he's, he's literally still holding the fucking uh, box cutter up, but he's like controlling himself. Like he's like, oh, he's like fighting against this urge because she has on the fishnets. Um, and he stares at the picture and he slowly brings it down. And then she says, bye. And he's able to like with, withstand his urge to like murder this little girl who might be his niece. Um, but again, it's just a little bit more of like establishing that like once this guy sees these fishnets, he just goes fucking, my man goes ape shit right so again we come back after this is we come back and we see um we see Susie at the station okay um and she gets a phone call from uh lousy and loud and dragon is basically like uh calling um or doesn't dragon doesn't ask i think lousy does uh he, he just gets on the phone and tells her we're not coming tonight right um and 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 he hangs up on her. he's fucking with it right and he's just like i just and, and lousy's like and i think dragon says something to the effect of like why are you doing that he's like i just want to scare her you know um he's like we're really not picking her up tonight right right um but dragon's like not really you know we just we just scare her or whatever uh then she can't do without me in the future see because the dragon really is trying to play a game like, you know, like, just scare her, like, so that, like, she will want him to come around. <laughs> uh, because it's the story, again, it's about, like, this this goofy sort of, like, portly, like, detective who's, like, funny and awkward trying to court this girl. Like, and then uh, as she's leaving, um, 
there's this funny scene again this is it's comedy right um she's coming out and we see this old security guard who's like reading like a manga he's like not paying attention he's like a really old dude he's smoking a cigarette like reading like some sort of like manga it looks like a comic um i know manga's japanese i understand that but like the i can't like uh it looks like a manga like from what i can tell from the cover again like when i was watching it it looked like he was reading comic um and she's like hey um i'm leaving do you have anything like that i can take with me for protection because you know again like she's been reporting on these murders and she's about to leave so the key gives her a box and in this box there's like a spiked it's like a it's not even a bat it's like a, a wooden pole with like nailed with like nails through it like a spiked nail she's like picking through this box so she's got this like spiked pole she tries to fit it in her little tote bag it won't fit there's like nunchucks there's like a ball and chain she's like going through all these random and she settles on like these brass knuckles <laughs> so she's got this pair of brass knuckles that she picks because she's gonna walk home by herself and he's like just remember to give it back and she walks out and then as she's leaving we see a dragon he's outside with a stupid ridiculous costume he's got on a fucking trench coat and like a a fucking santa claus mask and he's like practicing scaring her like right like he because again this is it's this kind of goofy shit that happens in this movie so she's like walking or whatever and like she's and and dragon jumps out right um <laughs> with his goofy fucking stupid first he makes a noise and makes her stop right and she's like kind of scared because it's like building the tension up but he does he jumps out and when he jumps out um sissy immediately hits him with the brass knuckles <laughs> And he's like legitimately staggered and hurt by the brass because she hits him right in the face with these fucking pair of brass knuckles. Really good too. And then he immediately is like, "Ow, stop, 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 stop!" And and lousy, he's sitting in the car. He he runs over to to uh to to like basically uh it, it, it get in the way, you know, to like he 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 enter he interferes. To, 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 he's like, "Hey, hey, hey, hey!" Like he's he's just kidding. He's just kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke, right? Uh, and she he pulls the mask off and she's pissed off and they're like she walks up she's walking away all mad and they follow her or whatever and that's when we see um as they're walking off in the shadows we see our killer he was out there so he was legitimately out there and i guess because he was pissed at sissy for what she said about him on the radio now not knowing his identity but basically calling him a cuckold um and let's be honest in 2021 motherfuckers don't like to be called cuck right so you can relate right you can relate he doesn't want to be called a cuck <laughs> so uh yeah, so th that immediately follows um, with them, uh, Sissy and Dragon and Lousy eating again. They're at like some, um, I don't know, it's like a outdoor, one of those like outdoor style like uh, cart, you know, where they're they're eating food or whatever, um, and they're having a discussion, and basically, Dragon is talking like he's like my I can barely open my mouth, you know, he's trying to get sympathy, right? And she's like, well, you shouldn't have jumped up out at me. And then Sissy offers to feed him. And immediately, because he's thirsty, he opens his mouth. And he says, see, I thought you could not open your mouth. And you're going to have to eat on your own. So it's like, <laughs> it's a little funny moment where he's like, he looks down at his, at his I guess he looks like he's eating soup of some kind. Again, I'm not quite sure what the dishes are they're eating. But it looks like they're eating like what can only be described as churro. I'm not familiar with like 80s Hong Kong cuisine or like. Even if this is 80s, it's cuisine in general. Like, uh, pardon my lack of sophistication or knowledge of of certain shit. Um, but uh, they're eating or whatever. And Dragon and uh, Sissy and Lousy are talking about the murders. And uh, Dragon offers to show her some more evidence at his place. He's like, I'll show you more. Just come by my place. And Sissy's like, oh, cool, sure. And then, of course, Lousy wants to go, too, because he's at third wheel. But he tells Lousy, hey, you have to go see this other case or some shit, right? And Lousy's like, what? And he's like, yeah, basically. So Lousy's kind of salty because he doesn't want to let him go, but he does. So Dragon takes Sissy back to his place. Now, as he's back in his, as he's, or, let me correct that. He doesn't take her back to his place. He says, come by my place. I'll meet you there. So we cut to like his place or the film cuts to his place and we see him like he's all got his he's looking in them 
in like uh, in in a picture frame and like looking at his reflection, and you see he's got a picture frame of himself, and he's got a picture of her, which is creepy than a motherfucker. Like you barely know this woman, you got a picture of her in her house, and he doesn't even care too because he keeps it in there because like she comes and she knocks on the door, and like he's opens the door, you see he's got like a little bandage where she punched him and shit over his bruise or whatever, and he's showing her around the house and shit, and like uh. <laughs> And like he's like have a seat or whatever, and he's trying to be smooth. But the whole point of the scene is like this is the most dorkiest motherfucker ever. <laughs> and he tries to get her to look at like uh, <laughs> this book. He's like, look, it's for your eyes only. It's some goodies inside. Like while like while I slip onto something more comfortable, like check this out. And she's like, I'm not trying to look at this shit. And it's basically like an album with pictures of him. So she starts looking at some like magazine that's on the table, <laughs> and she sees like some pictures of she sees this goofy cop picture of him and then she sees a picture of her <laughs> and then like the lights change and like disco ball lights come up and it's like oh and then the, my guy pops out in the most absurd ridiculous outfit like he looks like and again like i don't know like maybe it's a cultural thing i don't know <laughs> again i'm not familiar i was literally born when this movie came out so <laughs> outing my age here uh but he looks, he comes out and he looks like he's going to pride. Like the way that like people dress at pride is the way he comes out dressed to like be sexy or something to like sissy or whatever. To describe his outfit, he's got on like a gold, like he's first he's got on like a, a red and white where's Waldo kind of striped shirt. It's, an, it's a short sleeve shirt, but it's like, where's Waldo? Red, red and white stripes. Then he's got like silver, like eyeshadow with like green, like uh, glitter on the edges and like a rainbow colored headband. And he's got these pants. Now, the best way to describe Dragon's pants, right, is like, remember the Missy Elliott I can't stand the rain video where she has like the garbage bag outfit. Well, like these pants look like that, just the garbage bag pants. Like they're, I get, I don't know if they're like supposed to be patent leather, but they look like some Missy Elliott shit. And he's like got the disco lights going and he's like, he's singing the song that again, the 365 days a year love song or whatever that she played on the radio. Um, he's playing it right. And he's dancing. And my guy is like, He's vibing, like he's vibing. He's like, he's humping the air. He's doing. He does a knee slide. He's like trying to like. He's like aggressively trying to push up on her, right? And he's telling her like, hey, like, but not like ever. It's never like. Again, let me just say this. He's making overt passes at her, but it's never like creepy. Like it's always on some like this dude's just like a goofball, right? And so like he says, her, look at this book again that she didn't. And so she says, all right, fuck it. So she opens the book and she sees all these pictures of him. <laughs> these police academy pictures and it's just goofy. and she makes this funny face and she just sees him he looks goofy right and he's like this picture is when he comes up to her he tries to put his arm around he's like this picture is when i'm 14 and then like she's like what are we supposed to be doing work or chat and then he's like trying to be smooth this thing he's like don juan like like <laughs> the anti don juan he's like we could do both and she's like in that case bro i'm out and he's like all right, all right chill 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 okay we, we we'll just we'll just chat and he's like joking because uh, she was like, I'm leaving. He's like, oh, I'm joking, joking. He's like, all right, we could just do work. Okay, it was fine. And she's like, okay, cool. Well, I got to leave by 11. So he's like, all right, fuck it. I'll leave you alone. All right, I'll be, I'll chill the fuck out. You know, because again, ultimately Dragon, you know, he shoots his shot, but Dragon, he don't, you know, he ain't, he ain't being like, he's not being a sex pest. Let's put it that way. He's just letting it know like, yo, I, I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a colorful guy. And you know, I like you and I'm vibing. And if you, you should get with the, um, but he's not on some sex pest shit. So he shows her the little file or whatever. And he like, you know, I guess he goes to like get back in regular clothes. Cause he's dressed again. He's dressed like he was at pride. Um, or he, no, he doesn't even do that. He goes to get her some coffee. Right. Cause he said, I'll get you coffee or whatever. So she starts to look at the pictures and shit. And it's like the pictures of crime scene photos, literally the crime scene photos. And, um, she plays, a uh, a, a recorder of, uh, the, the woman who the woman whose murder was named Susie, right? And remember, her friend uh, gives a, a police statement, and we actually hear it played because Sissy plays it, and she listens to the woman as she's looking through slides of the murder scene at the same time, and she says that I saw the murderer um, strangle her to death, and it was a woman, 
and she's like what and she's explaining you know um that like Susie was strangled by her own silk stockings but then the murderer came into the bathroom to wash her hands and like basically like thank god that she didn't see me but i heard like i heard a pissing sound like i heard like and then she dried her hands with a towel and left or whatever and she threw it in the tub now um these are the seat the like as she's saying this uh pictures the corresponding pictures of the crime scene are flashing by at the same time as like this is being played the uh, the tape of her interview is being played and susie or not susie sissy sissy is like being a detective and she's like noticing like she's looking at all the evidence and what she notices is like the specifically the footprints there's bloody footprints of two high heels facing the toilet and she's putting it together in her head like wait a minute it's facing the toilet and and and, and, and like as she's piecing it together we see uh we see Dragon like walk back in. He's got like two plates. He's about to like bring her and him some food because he said he was going to make him some food. And he sees that like there's like a chalk outline drone on the floor when he comes back. The disco lights are still playing, by the way. And he sees like little footprints. And it's like literally she's drawn in chalk, redrawn like the murder scene. And she's in the bathroom standing next to the toilet. And he comes up with the plates, right? And she actually turns to sit around and he thinks she's going to pee. So he like literally spins around, and tries to be a gentleman. And she's like, no, 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 no. He's like, I'm not peeing. He's like, you want to see? He's like, you pissing or whatever. Then again, it's like a joke, you know. And she tells him to like show show her how he pees, right? And he so he just walks over and stands with the plates just in front of the toilet. And she's trying to illustrate to him basically, and she explains to him like, listen, the two bloody footprints were facing the toilet, like the uh, the. She said she heard the killer pee, so she's like. The difference, when I sit down, this is how I pee. She, she sits on the table. She's like, you notice the difference? I sit. Look at the footprints. Look at the difference in the footprints. She's like, he was, the killer was standing up while they used the bathroom. So it's not a woman. The killer is a man dressed as a woman. And we know, of course, that Su Sissy is 100% correct. And like... Dragon is actually kind of impressed. He's like, you know what? You're right. You're right. She goes back and she looks. She shows him the slides again, you know. Excuse me as I take another sip. And she's like, look, get it. Like, it's like, boom. Like, it's a man. Like, it's not a woman. And, you know, and, and of course, like, she's spot on. Um, and so it leads Dragon and the police um, to, like, on a plan to, like, get this killer um to come out right and they know that they're looking now for a man who uh who's who who dresses as a woman right um <laughs> and uh so she promises basically um our dragon <laughs> After the murderer's arrested, Dragon's really happy that she she's helped him like make a break in this case, right? And he's like, "Yo, after I close this case, you're helping me close this case." He's like, "But after I close this case, I'll be promoted, and then my salary will be revised, and then I can, and then we could get married." And she's like, "What?" Again, Dragon's like, you know, he's like really he really likes her, right? And she's like, "I'm not, you know, like I'm not marrying you type <laughs> fam or whatever like it's not but you know dress how dragon is he's not he's on that type of time like he he, he wants to marry sissy right <laughs> and she's like who says i'll marry you fam like you know you know like whatever he's like <laughs> but again this is all light-hearted so then we cut to like a scene of like sissy like walking in the in the uh she's got on fishnet white fishnets just the killer's light right and she's like walking and like in a dress and they're like and she's strutting and it's like very like performative and and then like we see that dragon and lousy are like watching her walk and she's like looks back and he's like they comment on her figure and she stops and looks back at him and then they all walk again and they all walk and they're all switching simultaneously in unison it's just a funny goofy ass fucking scene because this movie is simultaneously goofy as hell and simultaneously like a, a straight up like thriller serial killer movie uh or thrasher thr 
that cannot speak. Thra uh, uh, slasher, not Thrasher, it's not a skateboard movie. Uh, slasher slash Giallo at the same time. Again, it balances this weird high wire act that it pulls off. So the whole point of her wearing these fishnets is because they're, they're, she's going on television um, to draw the killer out. Um, so we see her talking on some random talk show. Uh, and the guy, uh, there's like some, again, like the, the, there's a, I don't, there's no, it's not established ever who, who this talk show host or this show she's on, but it's a, it's a public, it's the eighties too. There's not many, not many fucking channels. So she's on this local talk show and she's giving this interview and the, in and, and, and the interviewer saying that like, um, that, uh, sissy well, well prominently her legs are in the like in the fishnet stockings on display because they're trying to again they're trying to entice she's being bait so he's like ladies and gentlemen you know like the 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 the, the interviewer is saying ladies and gentlemen like we have like some information on the killer like the killer can be aroused if he sees people wearing suspenders and like white um fishnets and i mean like they i mean i guess they mean like the fish the suspenders that connect to the fishnets right um, and she's on the show showing the fishnets, like as an example, like these are the fishnets, like, like do not wear these, like uh, the police need your cooperation. This, this drives the killer mad. He wants, once he sees these, he wants to it make, it drives him to kill. Um, so simultaneously we see the killer at the shoe store. This dude works at a shoe store, like Al Bundy or some shit. And like he's he sees the the um because it's at a mall. So he looks across and he sees on this TV screen, he sees Susie or Sissy, and he sees her like modeling the stockings and he's listening to the thing, right? So immediately when he sees it, he's like he loses control. And like his boss is like, What are you doing? And he's like, Hey man, go back, get back, get back to work. Cause he literally walks away from a, a woman he's helping, right? And he like pushes his boss away because it's like he's he, he's like he can't help it. Like he's the murderer, you know, is aroused now. Like, so like we see him like calling on a pay on a phone inside of a place and he wants to speak to sissy. Right. And like, he's calling at the radio station and like, or, and, and they're saying like, she's already left or whatever. And it's later, it's later on after, um, after he's left his job. So we see him walking, leaving or whatever, and coming back to his, his, his place. And again, we see his the little girl, his niece or whatever, and she's still wearing them same fucking fishnet stockings, right? And she's getting thrown out of her house by her mom. She's saying she's a thief. Again, I don't know what the little girl's stealing, but this is the second time it's mentioned if I didn't mention that before, which I didn't, that like her mom's yelling at her about stealing shit. And then she's like, uncle, uncle, I didn't steal, uncle, whatever, some shit. And she's like dragging on him. And he's like trying not to look at her because he knows she has those fucking stockings on. So he's like, so she's like pulling on him like, you believe me? And he's looking at her and he's like, get away from me. Leave me the fuck alone. You know, I didn't steal my mommy's money. She's like pleading and he's like, yo, get away. And he like shuts the door on her and like, because he's like, he can't control himself because he's like, sees those stockings. So the little girl runs away, sad, you know, um, but saves her life. Little does she know, like, cause Unk, Unk, Unk is a fucking freak. Unk is a freak, bro. So, um. He's really turned up now. So, so uh, we come to the radio station at this point, right? Um, and I won't spoil this movie, even though I've said I'm not going to recap the movie um, the way I recapped uh, Too Young to Die. Um, and I think I haven't. I mean, I kind of am. I'm kind of going through beat by beat. But I feel like this movie's just worthy of description. Because again, like you just, but even with my description, it's nothing. You just really have to see it because I can tell you what the tone is, but you just got to watch it to see it. But so she comes back to the radio station or whatever. And the cops, um, dragon is there with, with the cops or whatever. And, um, they've, they've basically, um, they're provoking him. So she's on her radio show and she's, again, she's insulting him. Now we know she's was just on the TV she, uh, the, she was just on TV giving an interview with the stockings on and now she's on her show and she's calling him like a shameless wicked man and we see Dragon and, and Lousy and some other cops there like listening in and they're baiting him they're using her as bait 
you know what I'm saying? She's like, you're not a woman, you're a psychopath. You know, like, we know, like, you're a chicken. She's, like, calling him all kinds of shit, right? And she's saying, I want to meet you to see how tough you are or whatever. And, like, call in if you have guts or, and all this, all this shit. Like, she's re they're really laying it on thick, right? Um, so, she cuts to some music or whatever. And she's talking back and forth with the cops or with Dragon and stuff. And you're like, yeah, 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 you're really doing good. You know, I bet, he, I bet he'll call. I bet he'll call with, like, in, you know, better call in, like, 10 seconds. And literally, we see him in a store calling, trying to get in, trying to get it, get, uh, get on, right? But when she answers the phone, we see it's like, damn, 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 you know, like, we hear somebody calling her, you know, like, um, um, cursing at her and shit, right? Um. And it's, it's the, but it's not the killer. It's the guy who's obsessed with her. The dude that has all the pictures and shit, the guy that we, the red herring, the guy that we thought initially in the beginning might've been the killer because he's obsessed with her. So immediately the cops are like, yo, find out because they tracing the number when he calls in. They're like, yo, so he calls in and it's like cursing her out. Like he usually does because he's done this before and they find where he is. He's like somewhere in like, uh, uh, Kowloon City, flat B, sixth floor. So all the cops run out, boom, and they go to arrest this guy, right? Now, as they're doing that, not realizing who, <clears throat> not, real, not realizing like that this is the wrong guy, they're leaving Sissy by herself at the radio station while the killer pulls up in the taxi. Now, this whole last sequence, I'm not really going to ruin it because I do want people to watch. And I told you I'm not like here to just recap the whole movie completely. Um, and like, I don't want to do that. But um, yeah, like they pull up to the guy's house and like simultaneously um, the killer is at the radio station and he's like, we see him, he comes in, he like knocks out one cop. Then he like basically clubs the the secure the old security guard. He grabs some spiked like some spiked brass knuckles from that box of of, of weapons that we saw earlier, and he punches the guy in the back of the head. You know, takes him out. And the cops are like, they really think they they they're still over at this guy's house, and they automatically, of course, they think he's the killer. They they're in his apartment. They see all of the like pictures and the shit that he has up, and they really think that it's the killer. And they're like, they like take him out and everything. And like, uh, there's like a whole scene outside. They really think he's got him. And meanwhile, Sissy's, at, you know, she's still on, she's still working the radio and like, she gets a phone call and it's the killer calling from inside. She doesn't know he's inside, but he's like, they got the wrong one. I'm, you know, you know, um, and she's like, he's basically like, yo, I'm the murderer you're looking for. Um, they're not like. I'm here. I'm like fucking right here beside you. And and of course the, the tension immediately shifts from like lighthearted to again, it does this really well to like serious. He's like, you know, and he's like, if I want to be seen by you, I'll let you see me. Let's talk or whatever. And it's like a brief little like tension of her on the phone with him. Right. And she's asking him questions. Like, I know I want to know why you want to dress up and kill women in white stockings. And, you know, and it's just this whole conversation, right? And, like, she's trying to, like, subtly call the cops at the same time, right? But he's like, don't bother. I've cut all the lines. And, right, and then, like, he says he's even, like, he's even, like, dealt with the card. And he's like, and you're wearing white stockings. Because she never took them off. And he's like, and you know what I do to women who wear, you know, white stockings. I kill them or whatever. So, she, Sissy is very resourceful. So what she does is she decides to turn up the volume on the live radio broadcast so it plays out over the radio. So like while he's talking, it's playing through the radio. Now the cops are driving and they think it's like she's just doing a voice or a reenactment. They don't realize it's real yet. Um but he says he's not dressed up, right? Like he's just he's just and he's not. He's there. And like she sees his face appear like on the other side of like the glass in the fucking studio and then she runs, right? And then she they hear the scream and they're like, oh shit, the cops realize this is like like she's not playing. He's back at the station. So Dragon and Lousy's car, they 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 boom, they turn around and head back to the station. And she's like literally running through the station, being pursued by this guy. And this whole end sequence is like it's a perfect mixture of like like 
back and forth of like comedic, like it's like comedic moments and then like straight up like genre thriller moments. And like he's chasing her all around the fucking studio. Like, um, and like again, I will not recap this movie and completely ruin this third act for you. Um, but I will mention sort of some of the highlights of it, you know, just so you could see like there's a moment like he's chasing her with the uh fucking box cutter and then she grabs like a katana sword <laughs> and then she's like fending him off but of course every time she gets a chance to fend him off it's like his ki- like something happens you know what i'm saying and he gets the upper hand again but she chases him away briefly and there's just a series of scenes where you like and ultimately what happens is the cops do show up there right but they're so inept and sissy is so resourceful that ultimately sissy is the one who ultimately has to like dispatch of the killer and I won't go into like how this happens, but I will say that there are several sequences and several series of moments where like it looks like the cops are going to help, but then they fuck up and then Sissy is left on her own and then Sissy has to figure it out and she figures it out. But as much as we think she figures it out and she gets the upper hand, the killer ends up turning the tables again and getting reestablishing the upper hand. And it's just a series of this over and over again until the very, the very end, um, which involves it's a great it's a great moment in this movie when you with involving like a a seven up uh, a seven up machine <laughs> like you know a type of machine where you can buy soda from right um there's a very like memorable moment with a seven up machine um that when you see it you'll know exactly what I'm talking about um but um ultimately the film ends right and it's and, and it's a very it's a happy ending let's put it that way i'm not i will say that much i won't spoil how it ends but let's just say like that like the characters we we've we've known like to we've grown to like watching this movie who've like endeared us and we've been endeared to right um they sur- you know they they survive um things work themselves out and the movie ends um in a funny way too <laughs> and let's just say um it implies that maybe just maybe in a not so subtle way just maybe by the end of this movie dragon gets the girl maybe it's implied like sissy and it's not even implied it's just let's just say this like there's a funny sequence where uh dragon and sissy are wearing the same outfit except the difference is he's his says she and her says he as implying like you know like it's really silly really goofy uh but tonally again like it's tonally so different from the whole climactic final face off with the killer um but to go back to like how this film is a lot like like Jackie Chan films in terms of its humor the movie after it ends it even sh- the ending is even shows like blooper reels just like at the very end like when they show like the stunts and the outtakes at the end of like a Jackie Chan film um i guess this is just a prevalent thing in hong kong films and like but like it's a ser- we see a series of bloopers with like the killer the guy the actor playing the killer with every 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 like main member of the cast just blooper reels of the scene of like and again it's like it's just there's no movie like this fucking movie like um so if you want to see something that manages to make two films in one film and make those two films that are polar opposites kind of coexist um definitely see he lives by night. Also, it's the movie shot well. It's like the cinematography's like just like it's got some like really memorable shots. Like that Giallo influence. Like like yo Hong Kong. Like um, there's a lot of great like like examples of like Hong Kong cinema where like they shoot the shit out of it. Um, and this is definitely um one of them. So yeah, go seek this film out. I, I do realize that um, it's not easily findable, but I promise you it's out there. And when you find it, you won't be sorry. And that is episode three. And I will be back with another episode sooner than you think. Stay black or stay whatever you are. We belong to a new world, to a world, and a range of society. My baby and me, we belong to a new world.
Shh, <laughs> shh,